All right, welcome everyone. My name is Mike Evans, and this is Lecture 8 of the Innovative in Education series on Organic Chemistry. Uh, whether you're watching this live or recorded, just remember we are here to help you learn, so feel free to use this as a resource uh, in your own studies of organic chemistry if you're in a university course right now or what have you. But today we're going to be talking about um, chirality, optical activity, and labeling stereoisomers and sort of continue our discussion of stereochemistry and how the spatial properties of molecules have important effects on their reactivity and, uh, and their behavior. So, a little review of what we covered last time. Stereoisomers have the same connectivity but different shapes. And the example I gave oops, of stereoisomers last time was two compounds... with the same connectivity. You can see all the carbons are connected to carbons, oxygens to carbons and hydrogens, etc., but with different spatial relationships. So notice that in these two molecules there are different distances between the two oxygens. In this molecule on the right the oxygens are much closer. On the left they're much farther away. And the distances between atoms of course has a huge effect on the behavior of molecules. So these two molecules actually behave differently. Um, they have different melting and boiling points. They can potentially display different reactivity. They react to give different products in some cases. Um, and they are most certainly separable different compounds. So this really highlights the need to think about molecules in three dimensions because if we were to draw either of these simply in two dimensions we wouldn't really be able to appreciate the subtle structural differences that could exist in structures with this same connectivity. Um, you know, if we drew it just out like this, this could refer to either one of these what are called diastereomers because we don't know the shape of the molecule in three dimensions and knowing that shape shows us the subtle difference between these two molecules. Remember, there we call them diastereomers because the internal distances in the molecules are different. So the hydroxyl dis distance in particular I highlighted is diff different for these two molecules. Some molecules, however, have the property of all of the same internal dimensions, all of the same connectivity, and the same molecular formula. So they're isomers, they're stereoisomers, and they're not diastereomers because they have all the same internal dimensions, but yet they're not the same molecule in the sense that they can't be superimposed. And these are hand, your handed molecules, also known as enantiomers. So if you take a pair of very simple compounds, one of the sim two of the simplest enantiomers, or one of the simplest enantiomeric pairs, is shown here. So these two molecules are mere images of one another, but they're non-superimposable. If we tried to superimpose the hydroxyl group, the two hydroxyl groups, then we would have an ethyl group off to the left and a methyl off to the right if we moved that molecule on the right over. And if we tried to superimpose the two in-plane chains, then we wouldn't line up the hydroxyls correctly. So these molecules have what's called a property of handedness or chirality. They have a handedness to them, and you can kind of, kind of see it, how one molecule looks like one of your hands, and the other molecule looks like your other hand. And your hands, just like these molecules, are non-superimposable mirror images of each other. Notice that if one molecule were to look in a mirror, what it would see is exactly the other molecule. So we're going to explore this property in more detail today, particularly in the context of the physical consequences of possessing this property of chirality. Which, uh, which deal mostly with light and the observation of optical activity. Before we get there, though, I wanted to hit one more time this idea of what molecules are chiral and figuring that out. This is a problem that you will most certainly face if you're a student of organic chemistry. So let's take a look at a few examples. First example is benzene. Reflecting benzene through a mirror, say we place a mirror here perpendicular to the plane of the screen and reflect benzene through. Well then clearly we see that the molecule that we 
make after the reflection is superimposable on the original. Therefore, we say that benzene is achiral. It does not have the property of being handed, so it's achiral. On the other hand, if we take, oh, let's take um, a molecule that looks like this, a molecule with the three different halogens on it and a, um, a hydrogen as well, this tetrahedral molecule, if we reflect this through a plane, the mirror image here now is not superimposable on the original. Notice if we just slide that guy over is that the bromine and the hydrogen match up okay, but the fluorine and the chlorine do not. So we'd have the chlorine on the left and the fluorine on the right if we slid that guy over. So this molecule has the property of being chiral. This is the most general way to figure out whether a molecule is chiral or not, to actually reflect it and then see if it's superimposable on its mirror image. But there's actually a shortcut you can take. And the shortcut is, if a molecule possesses a plane of symmetry within it, or what's called an inversion center within it, then that molecule is achiral overall. So returning to the example of benzene now, benzene is a molecule which possesses a plane of symmetry within it. You can imagine a plane of symmetry here, perpendicular to the plane of the screen. You can imagine one here. It's actually got quite a few planes of symmetry in. Even having only one of these is sufficient enough to tell us that a molecule is achiral. Taking a look at a, more, a somewhat more complicated example that we're going to come back to a little later on, if you think about this molecule here, even though we do have to draw wedges to show where the hydroxyls are in three dimensions, this molecule actually possesses a plane of symmetry, and it's achiral. Because of that plane of symmetry. Molecules that have inversion centers also are achiral, and what an inversion center is, is essentially a center on the molecule that if you passed every atom on either side of the center through that center and then extended it out to the other side, you would arrive at the same position in the same type of atom. So a good example of this, for instance, might look like this. Say we had two carbons, two tetrahedral carbons, one next to the other, and we had several different substituents off of these carbons. So say we had an F here and an F here. We had a Cl here and a Cl here, and say we had a Br here and a Br here. And what, what you should see here is that this molecule possesses a inversion center, and the inversion center is smack dab in the middle of the molecule. If we took this chlorine in the front and passed it through the inversion center, kept it going through the back, we would arrive at the exact same position at the exact same distance that the original chlorine was from the inversion center. Similarly with the fluorine, if we took it and passed it through the inversion center and we went the same distance in the same direction out the other side, we would eventually arrive at a fluorine atom in that exact same position. And likewise with the bromine through the center. And then one that a lot of students don't appreciate is that even the two carbons adhere to this. So taking one carbon, passing it through the center and going all the way to the other carbon, we arrive at a carbon at the same distance. And so that's an example of an inversion center. And any molecule that possesses an inversion center is achiral. So this would be an example of an achiral molecule.